The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. In the 15th chapter, listen now for God's word to you. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, top to bottom. Now the centurion, who stood facing Jesus, saw that in this way he breathed his last, the centurion said, Truly, this man was God's son. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of the scriptures. To God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have crosses everywhere. In the narthex, as you're leading, leaving the church, I would ask that you look over as you're exiting to the left, the whole wall of crosses. Behind the communion table, we have crosses. The idea of the atonement is central to Christianity. Atonement at one net. We are, by sin, separated from God. Now, I know it's not popular to talk about sin in our present context. But the scriptures say and remind us that if we say we have no sin, we are self-deceived. And the truth is not in us. And I might add, we might better be looking for another religion. Because the atonement is central to who we are as Christians. If we happen not to believe that humans are almost predisposed to sin, turn on your television and watch the news. Listen to the radio, read a newspaper. There is no wiggle room here. This is a non-negotiable in Christianity. We can blame it on Adam, we can blame it on Eve, or we can blame it on ourselves, but the reality is that we are broken. And the fact remains, we do not live as God has called us to live. And because of that, there is a separation. How does one repair the gulf between God and humans? That comes under the theological heading of atonement at one month again. Now, many may be surprised this morning that the historical church has not adopted a doctrine of atonement as 
the last voice saying, here it is. We understand what happened on the cross. Listen to this. There is no official doctrine of the atonement in the Christian church. And yet it is center, central to Christianity. In the four Gospels, what we have, we have the, the recollection of what happened in Christ's passion. A gruesome death it was. It was needed, the Gospels will say, to restore us to God. But they do not give us a theological explanation of what it means Jesus died for my sins, our sins. Now, the epistles come along, and there are varied attempts to explain in piecemeal what happened at the cross. We have creeds to affirm the Trinity, the Apostles' Creed, to affirm the divine human nature of Christ, the Nicene Creed. And the atonement is mentioned in those creeds, but there is no explanation. So this morning, I want us to reflect on what it means that Jesus, the Messiah, died for the sins of human beings. Two hundred and seventy years before the first doctrine of atonement arises. Two hundred and seventy years after that Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Someone finally writes. His name was Gregory of Nyssa. And his doctrine is known as... Ransom theory of atonement. It goes like this. Because of Adam's fall and Eve's fall, we are now all given over to the devil. The devil owns us lock, stock, and barrel because we have failed. And God comes to the devil, how can I release my children from your control? And the devil says, pay me. And God says, how shall I pay? And the devil says, why not give me your only son? That's enough ransom. We are familiar with ransoms. We hear about them in the news that people are kidnapped and taken south. And then the cartel leader will call up and say, you can have your son or daughter back if you pay by this time. So God sends Christ into the world. He gives Jesus to the devil as a ransom payment for all of us. But it's a trick. A dirty trick. Because God raises Jesus up on the third day. And he who laughs last laughs best. And the devil is cheated. And the Rolling Stones sing sympathy for the devil. Scripture references Colossians, the second chapter, Hebrews, the second chapter, and Revelation, the twelfth chapter. These guys just didn't make it up out of the blue. 
Now, what is the pushback on this? Besides using biblical stories that may not actually relate in our own mindsets in the 21st century. The apparent one is the dualism. The good, good God and the bad, bad devil and they're fighting it out on the earth. God may rule in the heavens, but it's this is the devil's home. No longer, if this is true, can we sing this is my father's world. Although the wrong be off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Is God bound by that opposing force? What about the omnipotence of God? Are we talking about a God who is ultimately one not to be trusted in a business deal? The ethics of God? Trickery? Why did Jesus have to die? For a ransom. That's what it says. That was the predominant view of the Christian church for 800 years. Until in 1099... Anselm of Canterbury proposed another perspective. It's called the satisfaction theory of atonement. God tells first parents in the garden, do not eat of this tree. They did. And they broke the rule. God's honor and word is violated by not doing anything would that make God a liar so God sends his son who is human and divine but like Adam, he must take on our trials. He must take on our temptations. Where Adam fails, Jesus does not. So God is satisfied. Death sentence is averted. Cross reference Hebrews 10, 12, 14. They mention this approach. The rebuttal, on the other hand, does not this portray God as tyrannical? More concerned about God's honor than with love and mercy? Now, you have to realize, at the time this is written, feudalism is, the, in Europe, the form of government that the serfs and those below the lords of the manor were given protection from traveling terrorists, and they owed their own lives to the Lord. So if you violated the Lord, it had to be satisfied. It's couched in a language that they knew. And along a number of years later, in the 15th and 16th century, during the Protestant Reformation, they take the satisfaction theory of atonement and move it along. God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Now the accent mark comes on the death. Luther, John Calvin extended satisfaction theory 
to become known as substitutionary atonement. Death is the penalty of sin. God said it. You eat of the tree, you will die. And we too. We too, since we have also fallen short of the glory of God, we have a destiny with death, eternal death. But God in love sends his son to be a substitute, a substitute for the punishment. Jesus takes our penalty for our sins, even though he did not sin. Second Corinthians, fifth chapter, Galatians, third chapter. You, you realize that Paul is giving many different angles in these. Now, the rebuttal comes this way. The pushback comes this way, and I'll use an illustration because this is the most accepted form in the Reformed churches, even until today. Let's say we're going to school. We're all children this morning. This is a large one-room schoolhouse. We have a teacher. And all the children are coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds in that particular school, in our schoolhouse. And there's poor Timothy over there. He comes to school in ragged shirts, pants that are too short. He's a thin child. He's got many brothers and sisters. Recess comes and the children go out to recess, but Timothy stays behind and he goes and he looks at all the sack lunches stacked up where the stack, sack lunches are stored. Most likely he has had not had breakfast and Timothy did not bring a sack lunch. There's only one meal a day served at Timothy's home. He starts salivating. And he grabs a lunch, sticks it under his shirt, and runs out in the bushes while the other children are playing, and he devours it. When lunchtime comes, Bob goes to get his sack lunch, and it's not there. And he goes and tells the teacher, I don't know where my lunch went. And the teacher shouts, no lunches until somebody confesses. Who stole Bob's lunch? Silence. I mean it. Who took Bob's lunch? And the skinny little arm raises, it is the arm of Timothy. And the teacher says, you know the penalty for stealing in this school. Now come up and bend over this desk to receive your licks. About that time, Bob says, teacher, I'll take Timothy's whipping. Let him go. That is substitutionary atonement in a nutshell. And it becomes immediately 
glaring that there's a problem there, isn't it? That the teacher is more concerned about the rules and the punishment than the teacher is concerned about the starving child in the class. And Bob is more concerned about punishment being meted out on little Timothy then the teacher seems to be concerned. And that's the real issue with substitutionary atonement. That Jesus in substitutionary atonement seems to be more loving and merciful than God the Father. There's a bifurcation of God in all of this. But Jesus said, the Father and I are one. We are one in mind, one in love, and one. And what we would wish for human beings. And this is the primary one in most Protestant churches today. The last one. It's not all, folks. There are many. Back when old Anselm was writing his satisfaction, a contemporary of Anselm, Peter Abelard, said, No! No! God forgives. God doesn't have to jump through any hoops. The message is God has forgiven you. And he sends his only son to show us in the flesh that he has forgiven. Jesus also in this doctrine of atonement, known as the Abelardian doctrine of atonement and later the moral influence doctrine of atonement, Jesus shows what a sinful, sinless person actually looks like. And his message, God forgives you. It is the revelation of God's full love that happens on the cross of Christ. This is how far. Jesus is not the substitute. but is the victim of our own waywardness. And when we see that, how far we will go, according to this doctrine, it deeply influences us that God loves that much to be the victim why can't we respond? Now, personally, I like the last one. But, in all fairness, since I'm trying to represent all sides, we get some pushback. Number one being, we were in no danger at all of eternal death. And if we're in no danger at all, why not just come and tell us? Make it clear. Jesus could have said so. Now, I'll explain it this way in an illustration. I'm going to pick on somebody. Bob, you're, you're right there. I'll pick on Bob. He's a pretty good guy. He likes this. Now, Bob is gone down to Port Aransas and sitting out on a pier in his beach chair. And the pier extends out into the gulf there. 
And Bob is having a soda pop, right? Uh huh. And he's having a good time, and and I come down and say, "Hey, hey, Bob, I love you, man. I want to show you how much I love you." Now, I can't swim, but I'm going to show you how much I I jump in the water and drown. Now, Bob, being normal, says, that is the dumbest thing I have ever seen in my life. You see, that's the problem. Now, if Bob had stood up and start to embrace me, I know you love me, and tripped and fall in the water and is drowning, and then I jump in and save him and drown and save Bob, that's a whole nother thing. The question that we have on the pushback of Abelardian or moral influence is... What did Jesus accomplish by his death that he could not have accomplished by his teachings? These four represent pretty much the umbrella of many other dangling doctrines. So you might be asking yourself why this didactic sermon on these doctrines of atonement? Because this is Holy Week. And Holy Week is set apart for us to reflect what happened in Holy Week and how that makes an impact in our living in this present moment. How we should be reflecting. What does it mean? That Jesus died for my sins, for your sins, and for the sins of the world. I encourage you to rethink on that this week. Ponder it. You might be thinking, what if I don't get it right? Well then, welcome to the club. And I take solace. That full understanding is not the requirement to have faith. How many of you here this morning know all the intricacies of the internal combustion engine? Please raise your hand, Jerry. I know Jerry Mendenhall knows. How did you get here today? You drove a car that has an internal combustion engine. How many have you how many of you have flown in an airplane? How many of you are aeronautic aeronautical engineers? I didn't think so. You got there and you got back. Like many other things in Christianity, I do not understand, I accept. And I ponder. As those good people who have gone before me have done so. And I know as surely as I stand here in this moment that God's ways are not my ways. And it may be that in pondering the ways of God, we are actually drawing closer to that God who often speaks in paradoxes enshrouded in mysteries. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.